let's talk today about the one reason, well, one of a few reasons, why you're not speaking Turkish right now. I know you can't really see it very well, but right there on that screen is one of my favorite papers I wrote during my undergraduate program, which I then revised during my master's degree and presented a couple of times at a few different conferences over the years. But because that's distracting, let's close it. So pretty much what's going on during this time is there's a big conflict between the Ottoman Empire and, you know, the rest of Europe, especially Austria, which at the time was the center of the Roman Catholic Church. It was then actually called the Holy Roman Empire. It was ruled by a family called the Habsburgs. If you know anything about history, especially medieval and early modern, you know the name Habsburgs. Or you should. If you don't, go look them up. Interesting family. One of the reasons we have sickle cell anemia. Haha. <laughs> I'm actually gonna open this back up so I can review it for notes. So there are a few things that you need to know about right off the bat. First of all, we're taking place right now in 1683. So this is the height of what's called the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Now during this time in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, there were a number of things going on. First of all, the king was a man named Jan Sobieski III, and he won a lot of battles. He beat people from all over whenever they tried to invade. Cossacks, Muscovites, Turks, anyone who invaded, he was able to beat them off. Now another really fascinating thing is at this time the Poles didn't have a king that was given power by lineage. They actually elected their kings, which is really cool and something I just don't have time to go into right now. Now another Another thing you need to be really aware of is this cavalry unit called the Hussars. They're these really strong light cavalry units. And as far as the Polish Hussars go, they went about 125 years without losing a major battle. That's really impressive. Now one of the reasons they were so successful is because of their battle tactics and also because of their gear. So their battle tactics, essentially what they would do is they had these really light lances made out of pine and they'd come at you from one side and just mow right through you. And once they're through and as they're turning around, a second group comes at you perpendicular from the other side. And so you just keep getting bashed. One, two, three, four, back and forth like this, over and over again, until they run out of lances. And when they run out of lances is when the real carnage starts to happen. Because they have what's called a shabla, which is just a saber, but it was heavy as heck. And they would come through hacking and slashing and beating the crap out of anybody and everybody. So anyway, Jan Sobieski, elected king, hussars, really strong cavalry unit, Ottomans, kind of want to take over Europe. The stage is set. Now, the Ottomans strike a deal with France and say, hey, if we attack the Habsburgs from the east, will you join us and attack them from the west? And then we can, you know, take them over. We'll take Austria. You can be the head of the Catholic Church, which, oh my gosh, there's this whole big conflict. The Great Schism is fascinating. Just don't have time. Anyway, France agrees. France says, sure, you're gonna hop right in on this deal because we want to be in charge of the Catholic Church. We don't want the Habsburgs in charge of the Catholic Church. We don't want Vienna in charge. We want Avignon. All right, so the Ottoman Sultan at this time was a guy named Mehmed IV, and his lead general was a guy named Kara Mustafa. Anyway, so they start coming up through Greece, Hungary, you know, they skirt around Poland, but they go through Croatia and they get right up to the gates of Vienna. They're pretty much unstopped. And by the way, they have one of the largest forces in history at this point. They had 110,000 troops of their own to use, and then they had countries which paid tribute to them. And so all in all, they were able to amass an Ottoman army of somewhere around 200 to 250,000 soldiers. Now, as they're conquering on their way through Hungary, through Greece, through Romania, Bulgaria, all those places, they have to leave some of those troops behind to maintain order. So they don't have 250,000 troops with them when they show up at Vienna's gates. In fact, they probably only had about 100 to 150,000. Now, let's say that they, you know, let's, let's go in the middle there and say 120,000. About 30,000 of those people were strictly for the siege of Vienna. The remaining 80 to 90,000 are used for sealing off the fortress, making sure nobody can actually go in or out. So Vienna's in this really tough situation. Now Sobieski hears about this siege at Vienna, and at the same time, he also hears about how Leopold I, in this great act of courage, leaves the city of Vienna, you know, being the Holy Roman Emperor, and just abandons it leaves, takes 7,000 troops with him, and just deserts. So not only is Vienna under siege, but it's essentially without leadership. It's essentially defenseless. It's just a matter of time. 
If you know anything about Poles, you know that they've been deeply devoted to Catholicism and the church for hundreds of years, especially by this time. So this desertion really hits home for him. He's like, you're not only deserting your people, which is awful enough, but you're deserting the Catholic church to let it be taken by these Muslim leaders. He decides to leave with his 40,000 troops, only 40,000 by the way. He's vastly outnumbered. And he says, and I quote, gentlemen, I have never faced the infidels when their army was not three times the size of mine. It should be noted here that Sobieski has never lost <laughs> to these people. So he's pretty darn confident no matter how big or small his army is. So before they actually get to Vienna, they make an alliance with uh, the remaining European powers who are fighting against the Ottoman Empire and France. And all in all, Ottoman sources suggest that they were able to amass an army that was about 120,000 soldiers. So when you actually come down to it, they weren't really outnumbered. It's just the Polish army itself was outnumbered. Their plan was that Sobieski was going to come with his hussars and attack the main force at the very front of the gates. And while he's doing that, the other two European powers that he's with, mostly the Habsburgs, are going to divide their forces and flank from the sides once those main forces are weakened by Sobieski and his hussars. So they get there and word of Sobieski's arrival reaches the Ottoman leaders. Now of those different groups that the Ottomans were able to recruit troops from, one of them was the Tatars, also known, you might think of them more as the remnants of the Mongol Empire. They even use the word Khan. So Khan Muregire, I can't pronounce that correctly, I'm sure, looks at Kara Mustafa and he says, and I'm going to read this here again, this happened in 1683, take the exact quote with a grain of salt. Bring the remaining troops from your trenches to face the damn poles. I know Sobieski well. Where he is, flight is our only refuge. Look out upon the firmament and you will see that Allah himself is against us. Again, whether or not that was actually said, who knows? makes a good story. So Kari Mustafa hears this and says, no way, man, we got this. We're going to do it. And because he refuses to take his troops away from the siege and face Sobieski, Muregire runs off with his 20,000 Tatars. Tatars? Tatars? Tatars. I was wrong both times. So Sobieski shows up and as he's surveying the remaining troops around Vienna, he looks out and goes, <laughs> these guys don't know what they're doing. They're poorly encamped. This is going to be easy. Now, one thing we should point out about the Ottoman military is they had a history of taking new technologies, but instead of adapting their tactics to the technologies, they adapted the technology to their tactics. What that means is you have these really big, impressive cannons. We're, we're talking huge. So everyone else adapts new technology and when they lay siege, they have two types of siege weapons, one for the city that they're laying siege on and one for defense. Well, the Ottomans, just do the ones for the city. So they have these big old guns that can't really be maneuvered and aimed very well. By the time they're able to maneuver all these giant guns to where they need to be pointed to attack Sobieski, he's already moved, he's already out. So these guns are essentially useless. Here's the other thing, small guns, very effective against Hussars. That's the main reason the Hussars ended up falling out of their use was because handguns, pistols, you know, rifles started becoming such common use that no matter what armor they wore, it wasn't worth it. So you'd think that the Ottomans would look at those winged Hussars and say, hey, look, a pistol could take him down. But no, instead of making cheap, small guns for their entire army, they only make a few big guns for their siege. And that's all they bring with them. So after a few initial test charges, Sobieski ends up leading several of these charges himself, at least so the story goes. I'm very skeptical anytime a source or a picture shows some leader actually leading a charge himself. Now initially the Ottomans fought back pretty valiantly, right? They were able to defend themselves and fought hard. But here's the thing about those Hussar charges. As I mentioned, they don't really stop. And so they just kept coming and coming and coming and coming and coming. And once they realized that it wasn't going to stop anytime soon, a lot of them started to give up. Now, right as they're giving up, these other two forces start attacking from their flanks and cut off a lot of their escape over rivers and through some of these other valleys. And so you can't really go anywhere. You're stuck there. You become sieged while you're sieged 
raging. And once the people in Vienna realized what was going on, they started fighting back too. So you go from the Ottomans having this siege on the city from pretty much every direction to they themselves being attacked from every direction. And so in theory, this battle should have lasted two, maybe three days, just looking at the sheer number of people that were involved. But because of the Hussars and Sobieski, one day. The whole battle was over and done in one day. And I want to read you another quote here, which is from, I'm going to butcher this name, Silahdar Mehmed Aga. What's interesting about this quote that I'm about to read you from, that man whose name I can't pronounce, is that he did not hold back in his criticism of his own people. He wrote, May Allah preserve us. This was a calamitous defeat of such magnitude that there has never been its like since the first appearance of the Ottoman state. Now, traditionally, once the city was liberated, Leopold I, again, Holy Roman Emperor, should have been the one to enter the city first. He's the leader, he's the owner of the city, he's the one who runs things, he should have been the first one in there. Sobieski is like, nah, brah, you deserted these people, you deserted this town, you weren't even here, you didn't do any of the work, I did it. I'm going to be the first one to enter the city. And what this does is this makes people in Vienna see Sobieski as their savior, as the one who actually did all the work, which, you know, he kind of did. But this pisses off Leopold I so much to the point where he later denies a statue be built in Sobieski's honor. But this is interesting because historian James Pula wrote in a 2015 article that this battle, Sobieski's tactics, Sobieski's efforts themselves, saved Europe from the eventual subjugation of Muslim rule. Because let's think here, the Ottomans have so many more people to work with. Even if they were able to take over Vienna and take over the Holy Roman Empire and they held their alliance with France, eventually they're gonna set their sights on France. At some point in time, those two are going to fight over power. Who gets to rule in the area? Especially since each side, being Christian and Muslim, had this huge competition going on over which would be the dominant religion in that part of the world. And so while in theory they may have allowed themselves to be peaceful for a time, eventually that conflict would have grown too much, and this conflict over dominance for the region's religion would have escalated into something way bigger. And personally, I'm of the stance that the French would not have been able to stand up to that. Hey, hope you enjoyed the video. Please drop a like and a subscribe. I don't know which thing is where, but it's somewhere around here. If you like history, if you like other videos, please give me a like, please give me a subscribe, and I'll keep posting them. If you like drums, I have another channel where I post drum covers, so please go check that out too. Link in the description.